knowledge and joy, while to the sinner he has given the task of gathering and collecting so that he may give to the one who is good in God's sight. This too is vanity and a striving after wind. I had to come back to this because really I wanted to look at verses 24 through 26 a little bit more carefully, especially verse 24. Uh, We're going to unpack that a little bit for you this morning as we walk through it. The title of the message is this, Enjoy Life and Be Thankful to God. And this really is the message that Solomon is leaving for us at the end of this chapter, although it's a a very rocky road that he leads us down. And and I want to go back and, and pick up the flow of this. Uh, together as we walk through this and then come to verses 24 through 26. But he isn't advocating us to eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. That's not his purpose in this. This is not the philosophy of fatalism, but of faith. And he is going to move us in that direction. He has taken us on this journey in which he has no mention of God, save for chapter 1, verse 13, and then here again at the very end of chapter 2. But God is going to become a focal point through the rest of Ecclesiastes and especially in chapter 3, because he's going to establish the divine order of things. But he wants us to understand that we are to thank God for what we do have and enjoy Him and enjoy it and glorify Him through the things that He provides for us. And we know the secret for us as believers is that our stuff and our satisfaction are two different things. And we also know that our satisfaction doesn't come from our stuff, but it comes from our Savior. And when we're satisfied in Him, then we can appreciate the things that He gives to us, and we can enjoy them for what they are, and they never take the place of God Himself. But there is a tendency sometimes, when we get so caught up in the things that He gives us, that we lose sight of the giver, and we focus on the gift. And Solomon wants us to understand in these final verses that he is the giver of the gift and we need to appreciate that fact. And we can enjoy the things that he has given us so long as we enjoy them and give him the glory for that. And so he calls us to enjoy what God has given to us and not what we seek after to try and satisfy ourselves. There is this tendency sometimes when we do this, and I was thinking about this two young brothers that I was discipling years and years ago. And they were both brothers, Matt and John. And Matt and I, we hit it off pretty quickly. He was younger than John, and he was into soccer, so I was into soccer, so I helped him figure out some moves and stuff like that for soccer. But one of the things that I got him into was surfing. So Matt and I would go surfing, and John decided he wanted to try it out. So I took him down to the surf shop. I helped him find a board, and the guy that I, he was buying the board from was a guy that I knew, and he had also sold me one of my boards, and so he gave John a great deal on the board. And so John was ecstatic because he had saved up this money to buy a board. It cost him less than he thought it was going to cost him, so he walked away with some money in his pocket, but then he realized, hey, this is a brand new board. I can turn around and resell it for a higher price and make some money off it, and then I'll buy another board. And so he had this whole plan schemed out of how he was going to do this. And he would just keep building up, building up, building up, and he would make some money. And so it was funny because then Matt and I would invite him to go surfing. He would go with us to the beach, but he'd never get in the water. There was always a reason why he couldn't do it. Either the waves were too big or it was too choppy and something might happen to the board. Or, you know, the waves are so small it's not worth getting out for, and so I'm just going to sit here. So John would go and sit with his board next to him on the beach and watch Matt and I surf all afternoon. And I thought, John, this is crazy, man. You have this board. You will never go in the water. He's like, but I don't want to wreck it because I don't want to diminish its resale value. (laughs) So one day, Matt borrows John's skateboard. And John says, sure, it's in my room. So Matt goes in his room to get the skateboard. And as he's walking out, he's closing John's bedroom door. Well, it slammed a little bit harder than he thought it would. And John's board was leaning against the wall. And as the door slammed, the wall shook. And the board slid down and hit the end of John's bed put a nice ding in it. All of a sudden, John's looking at the board saying, where's the resale value, right? It's all gone now. All my money's lost. And I said, well, now you can go surfing. (laughs) So he got out there and went surfing, and he comes out the first day I took him out, and he comes out, and he's like, that was the most amazing time I've ever had. He goes, I've been missing it all this time. But see, we do this, don't we? God provides things for us. He gives us gifts, and we get so hung up on the gift, and we try to preserve it, and we want to take care of it, that we don't even enjoy what he gives us as a gift. 
So this is where Solomon is taking us in this. Is he wants us to understand that these are gifts from God. Enjoy them. But they shouldn't be all-consuming for us. And we shouldn't lose sight of the giver. So John, or Solomon takes us on this journey as he walks through this, and he deals with the futility of pleasure in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, and everything is about focusing on himself. Verse 13, I set my mind to seek and explore by wisdom. He says in verse 16, I said to myself, literally, I communed with my heart. Behold, I will magnify, increase in wisdom. And he has this discussion again in chapter 2, verse 1. Everything about this is I, I, I. And then when he talks about the pleasures that he has in verses 4 and following, it's all about myself, myself, myself. What Solomon is going to help us to understand is that we were meant to enjoy someone who is infinitely greater infinitely more satisfying than ourselves and the things that we have. And it's interesting because I came across this study that was done, a poll that was taken as far as Americans go. And the poll said 84% of Americans believe that enjoying yourself is the highest goal in life. This is who we're witnessing to. This is their focus. This is the life that they live. 86% believe that to enjoy yourself, you must pursue the things you desire most. The study went on to reveal that 91% affirmed this statement, to find yourself, you need to look within yourself. This is where we find truth. This is where we find meaning. This is where we find purpose. These are our neighbors. This is what they look for. So in reality, we could say that the fastest growing religion right now is self-worship. This is the society that surrounds us. And if it isn't the fastest growing religion, it is definitely the oldest one. And there are a series of sacred commandments. If you listen to your neighbors talk and if you listen to them speak, you will hear these things over and over and over again. The first commandment is this. Your mind is the source and standard of truth. So no matter what, trust yourself. Hashtag the answers are within. I don't need any objective truth. I have my truth. I have all the answers that I need within myself. Solomon tried that, did he not? As he walked through these first two chapters, four, especially in chapter two, he sought to find answers within himself, satisfaction within himself, and what he found was he needs God. The second commandment is this, your emotions are authoritative, so never question or let anyone else question your feelings. Hashtag follow your heart. This is the Hallmark Channel, like every movie, right? This is their motto. Follow your heart, <laughs> and it will lead you to misery. Number three, you are sovereign, so flex your omnipotence and bend the universe around your dreams and desires. Hashtag, live your truth. We've heard all of these things over and over again in society. Command number four, you are supreme, so always act according to your chief end, to glorify and enjoy yourself forever. Hashtag YOLO. You only live once, so live for yourself. Number five, you are the summum bonum, the standard of goodness. So don't let anyone oppress you with the antiquated notion of being a sinner who needs grace. We live in the age of positivism. You can't say anything negative. This is the new law. You can't say anything is wrong with somebody. Hashtag never change. Stay the same. Number six, and the final one, you are the creator. So use that limitless creative power to craft your identity and your purpose. Hashtag authenticity. Be your authentic self. You're the one who crafts this and designs this. But what I find in Psalm 139 is that he is the one who designs us and crafts us in the womb. He is the one who makes us who we are. Therefore, it is to him that I look for identity and meaning in my life. The consequences of this self-worship are drastic, and we've seen this through Solomon's argument as he goes through the first two chapters. When we try to be our own source of truth, we slowly drive ourselves mad. He's going to talk about this in chapter 9, the insanity that is in man. When we try to be our own sources of satisfaction, we become miserable wrecks. This is his conclusion. Everything is fleeting. This is frustration. This is vanity. I find nothing satisfying in myself. When you become your own standard of goodness and justice, we become obnoxiously self-righteous. 
That's why when we go to the world, it's not our standard we're holding them up to, it's God's standard. It is that objective body of truth that lies outside of us, and it holds all of us accountable. And it is unbiased. When we seek self-glorification, we become inglorious. More and more so, we see this in man, the ugliness of our sinfulness when we turn to ourselves. And the reason for this is because we're not God. We weren't meant to trust in ourselves. We weren't meant to define ourselves. We weren't meant to be satisfied in ourselves. We weren't to be captivated by ourselves. And yet we do this over and over and over again. We celebrate self. These pride festivals and all of these things that go on in society around us, it is all about a celebration of self. It is pride in self. And it is going to bring about complete and utter destruction of humanity. Because it is anti-human is what it is. We become most truly and freely ourselves then in a state of self-forgetful reverence. The more that I surrender myself to him, the more I understand who I am. Why? Because he's the one who made me. Solomon takes us to the futility of wisdom and then the futility of work, verses 18 through 23. Now, walk with me as we do this. We're going to move into verses 24 through 26. He is going to lay out his assessment of those things under the sun. And notice the recurring phrases that come in his assessment, starting in verse 18. He begins with the issue of the fact that it is under the sun. And this is the crescendo that keeps coming to us over and over again. It starts in verse 17. He carries it over into verse 18, verse 19, verse 20, and verse 20. 22. He keeps coming back to this thought again. This is life under the sun. The other is the element of this is all vanity. And he closes each subsection with this. Verse 20, verse 20, uh, verse 19 is the first time. To this, this too is vanity. Verse 21, this too is vanity. Verse 23, this too is vanity. And then he ends verse 26, this too is vanity, talking about the sinner who gathers and collects for himself only to lose it to the one who is good in the sight of God. The other refrain that walks through this is that this is striving after the wind and he closes this off with this. But it's interesting because if you look at verse 17, all three of these things are there in the summation of verses 12 through 16. So he prepares us for this. He is going to take us on a downward spiral is what Solomon is going to do for us. And then he's going to climax in verses 24 through 26. But we have to understand the movement and see what he does here. There is this element of irony here. Because in verse 10, we saw that he made the statement. If you notice within the text, he says, My heart was pleased because of all my labor. Now look at verse 18. Thus I hated all the fruit of my labor. First I took delight in it. First I was pleased in it. Now I can't stand it. Why? Why? Because he is coming to the point of complete despair. As he is looking at the things that he has accomplished, and he is finding that he has no satisfaction in them whatsoever. Not only that, but in verse 20, he says this in the NAS, Therefore I completely despair of all the fruit of my labor for which I have labored under the sun. Now, the first thing I have to show you is this verse, verse 20, is it literally is this in the Hebrew, if I can bring it out in English. Therefore I turned I to despair my heart. In other words, what Solomon is saying here is that he is the one who brings his own heart into a condition of despair by the choices that he made. He did this to himself. His disillusionment with life, it's his own creation. He created his own frustration. Instead of just merely enjoying the things that God gave him, he looked at the gifts and the things that were before him, and he kept saying, I want more, 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 more. And instead of looking at the giver of the gift, he looked at the giver and he saw himself as being the one who could satisfy himself. And all of a sudden, God's not in the picture anymore. And it's, I can provide this for me. In other words, his happiness, his worst enemy is him. He robs himself of the joy that God gives. How many times do we do that when God provides these things for us and we don't accept them thankfully and we don't receive them and just appreciate them for what they are and enjoy them and glorify God as we enjoy them? They all of a sudden take us over and they consume our thoughts and before you know it, God's out of the picture. Or become like John instead of thanking God for the gift that was given and the deal that was given. 
John turned it around and figured out how he could make himself more money and how he could profit and how he could gain from it. And all of a sudden it became about him and about accumulation. This is the way of the world. So why does he plunge himself into such despair is that he ultimately he obsesses over his life's work. And he realizes that this, at the end of this, this is the selfishness that sits at the heart of his complaint. Verse 22, notice with me. For what does a man get in all his labor and in his striving with which he labors under the sun? What he's getting at here is he's asking the question, what happens to the man himself, he says. What happens to me when I strive to achieve? What is it that I go through? Verse 23, days of labor are filled with pain and anxiety, and even night my mind cannot rest. I have sleepless, anxious nights. Why? Because he looks at the things that he has and he goes to bed, and instead of sleeping and finding rest and contentment, he's thinking about more, more, more. What else can I do? I have to fix this. I have to make this better. I have to make this bigger. I need more of this. I need more of that. I can't find any sleep because it's all about work. It's all about gain. There's no contentment. There's no rest. He says, all I have is pain, anxiety, and restless sleep. So then he brings us to verses 24 through 26. You see how he's just reached the bottom? <laughs> he is despairing. Forget what I leave behind to somebody else. I can't even find satisfaction in it myself. And after all the labor that I invest in this stuff, at night what do I have to show for it? Pain and anxiety and no rest, no contentment. All of a sudden, the flash bulb goes. He gets this flash of insight. Now he's going to round off this whole section for us and it prepares us for what comes in chapter 3 because he is going to give us the divine order of things in chapter 3 verse 1. There is an appointed time for everything. There is a time for every event under heaven. Now he's going to reveal God's control of things. The sovereignty of God. This is where he is going to find answers for himself. Because now he's going to reflect on eternity. All of these things should be viewed in light of eternity. And when you view eternity and everything in light of that, all of this stuff becomes insignificant. Or as Proverbs puts it, the material becomes immaterial. The stuff is just stuff. And my satisfaction is in God. Not in myself. And not what I achieve. So having described then the frustration of grounding oneself in this world under the sun, which has no key for satisfaction, C.S. Lewis had this amazing thought. <laughs> it always comes back to me when I think about passages like this. He said this, he said, Prosperity knits a man to the world. He feels that he is finding his place in it, while in reality it is finding its place in him. The reality is Solomon's going to help us to understand you don't fit in this world. Why? Because you don't belong here. There is something in you that is beckoning you to something far greater. That is the eternity that lies within. And nothing temporal can fill that hole in your life. And nothing can satisfy but God and God himself. The giver of all gifts. So he says to us, enjoy what God has given to you, but not what you seek after to try and satisfy yourself. So as Kidner puts it this way, the transition that happens here, the preacher has held before his readers two ways of life, the vicious cycles of the pointless world, temporary pleasures, fruitless work, futile wisdom, inevitable death, versus an enjoyable life taken daily from the hand of God and the assurance of faith that he deals appropriately with righteous and unrighteous. The amazing thing is that the unrighteous don't even know that they do this, that when they gather and accumulate, that they're doing it for the righteous. That God even provides for his own through the hand of an unbeliever. That everything rests in his control. So just keep this thought in mind. Go home and read Psalm 127. Reflect on this passage in light of that psalm and remember that Solomon is the one who wrote Psalm 127. That God provides for his people even while they sleep. So be content when you go to bed tonight. Rest assured that God will provide. He is the giver of all good gifts. You don't need to stress. 
You don't need to go to bed in pain, well, relatively, but you don't need to go to bed in pain and anxiety. But just trust that he has all things under control. So Solomon's exhortation to us then in verses 24 and 25 is God's gifts are good and should be enjoyed with thanksgiving. And he gives us the basic gifts, food, drink, and work. We ought to be satisfied with these things. It doesn't mean that maybe, you know, you need another job and you're going to go work somewhere else. That, that's fine. But just remember, sometimes we're so busy moving onward and upward and pursuing and being good consumers that we forget to just stop and thank God for the things that we do have right here, right now, today. What does he put on the table before you? I mean, this is with my kids. I, I grind this in them, and I hope that this is something that they walk away with in their own life, that they will pray over every meal, the realization that whatever food is on the table, God put it there. Whatever clothes you have on your back, God gave those to you. Whatever roof is over your head, God has provided that for you. And we need to thank him for that. So often we forget that the basic things of life, we take them for granted, that there's food in the fridge every time we open it, or there's food in the, the cupboards when we open it, whatever it is that you eat, right? But he provides that for us. Sometimes it's just hot dogs. There were periods where we had hot dogs every night for dinner, but we were thankful. Why? Because there's food. And God never promised you're going to eat filet mignon every single night for dinner, but he did promise, I will provide for you. You will have food to eat. Solomon says these gifts are from the sovereign providential hand of God and no satisfaction apart from appreciation of God's good gifts. As he brings this out in verse 24, this also I have seen that it is from the hand of God for who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him. Not only does God give us these gifts, God enables us to enjoy these gifts. This is a part of his design for us. We should enjoy them. Now, I have to do this for you because it's really rather unfortunate. And Solomon's planting a seed here for what is to come. Okay, And so I talk about the endemic sinful nature of man. He's going to talk about this starting in chapter 3 on, but he plants a seed here for us. And I have to do this for you. Really, verse 24, it's unfortunate. There is nothing better for a man than to eat, drink, and tell himself that labor is good. This is really unfortunate. And it's rendered exactly like, if you turn to chapter 8, verse 15 of Ecclesiastes, look at verse 8, uh, 15 of chapter 8. Chapter 8, 15 says this, For there is nothing good for a man under the sun except to eat and drink and so on, right? So it seems like the exact same wording. Okay? And in your English translations, this is so. The NASB, this is what they have. So verse 24 of chapter 2 sounds very much like chapter 8, verse 15, but they are not the same in the Hebrew. Verse 24, then they render this this way, there is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink, but that is not what Solomon says here. There is a difference in prepositions that he uses with the wording here. The first one is Lamed, and it is for a man. The one in verse 24 is the preposition bet, which is in. In other words, what Solomon says here is there is no good in man that he eat and drink his soul, see good, that is dealing with satisfaction in his labor. There is no good in man. He is planting a seed for what is to come, but this is literally what he says in the Hebrew. Now, the reason that others will amend this is because it doesn't fit their way of thinking. And I really have a problem, and this only usually happens with the Old Testament, never with the New, but the New Testament, we have variant manuscripts. We know this, right? We, we go through books and we study them, and sometimes we have manuscripts that read this word rather than that word. And so there is this discussion of which word was the original. In Hebrew, we don't have that. Most often what happens is that if someone reads something they just can't put a finger on or it doesn't make sense to them, they suggest that we amend the text. In other words, change what's there. Well, I have a problem with changing Scripture to make it fit what we want to believe or what we believe. I don't do that with my theology. I can't do that here. 
So this is what Solomon says. There is no good in man that he eat, drink, his soul, see good. This is talking about satisfaction in its labors. And Leopold grabs hold of this very clearly. And he says it this way. It is not a good thing inherent in man that he is able to eat and drink and get satisfaction in his toil. In other words, he is preparing us for the statement that comes that these things I have seen, they are from the hand of God. And you cannot enjoy them without him. And Solomon is helping us to understand there is no good in you. You can't find satisfaction in the things that you have in and of yourself. You can't do this in and of yourself. You can't find meaning. You can't find purpose in and of yourself. You need God. God is the answer. This is that turning point for him as he's walking through Ecclesiastes. This is that moment. He isn't repented yet, but he is walking us through this journey that he has taken. And the realization that he comes to at the end of chapter 2. So Leopold goes on to say this, that what the author seeks to indicate is that even the simplest forms of enjoyment cannot be made to yield satisfaction by man himself. The wording is awkward. But oftentimes I have found that some of the most fruitful thoughts in Scripture are the most hard to understand right away. They make you ponder on them. They make you think on them. They make you meditate. But this is what Solomon is getting at. He is coming to the end of himself. He is like the prodigal son, right? And all of a sudden, he's eating the food that is offered to the swine. And he's sitting there looking at himself going, look what I have become. Solomon is at this moment in his life when he looks at all the things that he has amassed and he looks back and he says, I'm not happy at all. I have turned my own heart to despair. I find no satisfaction in anything that I've done and I have no satisfaction in myself. And the only true satisfaction is in God and God alone. And it's only through him that I can enjoy these things. Enjoyment of life, it is the gift from God. This is what he wants us to grasp. God-given enjoyment does not give us the approval to hedonism, but yet at the same time we are supposed to enjoy and be thankful for the things that we have. And it comes in varying degrees in God's providence, do they not? Some have this job, some have that job, some have this kind of retirement, some that kind of retirement. I have the earned retirement. I retire when they cremate me and stick me in the urn. That's the only way I'm retiring. I have nothing waiting for me but heaven. We all have these walks in life and God provides for us differently in His providence, however He chooses to do so. But whatever He gives you, it is His gift. Enjoy that. Don't look at someone else and go, gee, I wish I had what they had. Be thankful for what you have. Because in reality, we don't deserve anything. In reality, I don't deserve any blessing at all in my life. And yet God graciously gives it to us, does he not? The gift of salvation. There is no house guaranteed in the plan of salvation. There's no car guaranteed in the plan of salvation. And yet he nonetheless bestows these things on us. Because our Father loves and cares for us. Because our God is a good God. Don't forget to thank him for that. So Solomon understands, verse 26, that God's gifts ultimately flow to the righteous. There are different strokes for different folks. You have the righteous, you have the sinner. And we'll talk about this because generally this is true. But Solomon's going to talk about sometimes there's those exceptions. And remember, we're dealing with wisdom type of literature. Generally, this is true. But sometimes it seems as though the wicked thrive and we don't. Well, Solomon is going to deal with those issues in Ecclesiastes for us. Because this is wisdom put to life. But there is nothing but futility for the sinner apart from God. And in the end, this is his statement. This too is vanity and a striving after wind. Life in this world can only have true significance and provide true enjoyment for the believer. We understand what lies behind all of this stuff. The unbeliever does not. They don't understand that the same God who causes it to rain for us causes it to rain for the unbeliever. He's the same one who provides food for us, provides for them. They don't know this. They don't understand this. We are exhorted then by Solomon to look for the hand of God in the events of our daily life. And when God grants these things, thank Him for them. 
this final thought I leave with you, and I don't remember where I heard it. I wrote it down, so I have to tell you it's not my own. But it went something like this. If we take God's gifts and decisions as they come with thanks and don't try to manipulate or outwit God, we will find our pleasure in what He gives us daily. And we should thank Him for that. Amen? And let's not be like John and the surfboard. Dad, would you close in a word of prayer?